ACNFers, you are in for a treat. Elena Passarello returns to talk about, shoot, I don't know. You know, this this stupid rat thing that's tearing the ass out of me right now. So... Well, oh, all right. Well, that's a work in progress. Uh, in any case, this is the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, the show where I talk to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. I'm Brendan O'Mara. Welcome to it. You can follow the show at CNF Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And if you head over to BrendanO'Mara.com, hey, hey, you can find show notes to this and a billion other episodes. You may also sign up for the monthly newsletter where I give out reading recommendations. Links to articles, podcasts, news, and exclusive CNF and Happy Hour, of which Elena has been a special guest. And you would know that if you were a member of the newsletter list. And I forgot to put it in the April one. My bad. It will be in the it will be in the May one. In any case, all things writing, art, first of the month, no spam, can't beat it. So Elena. Passarello is here, my good friend, and it's nice when her kind comes slumming with a dude like me. She was in the thick of a deadline for a piece for Audubon, and oh, I don't know, what's the word? My brain is oatmeal. She's somewhat of a weirdo animal writer on account of her wildly popular and successful, what what does success even mean? Uh, Her book, successful book, Animal Strike Curious Poses. It's an incredible book. She also wrote the collection, Let Me Clear My Throat. She recently had a piece about the oldest bird in the world, a laison, if I'm pronouncing that right, albatross. So she's in it, man. She's in this freelance assignment. She's a professor at Oregon State University. She's on every single panel you can imagine. She's a super star, man. Superstar. I mean, she wouldn't say that, but I'll say it. Speaking of being in it, Summer Audio Magazine is on schedule, and if you want in on this exciting issue, you're going to have to head over to patreon.com slash cnfpod and become a CNF member. Every tier gets you access to the magazine. So for as little as $2 a month, you get the magazine and also a chance to ask questions of guests. I put that out to the Patreon community. I got a little thing back. Betsy heeded the call, and I asked one of her questions late in this show with Elena. Pretty cool, right? For a little more than the $2 a month tier, you can shop around, window shop, get transcripts, coaching, and the knowledge that you're helping out this community, helping writers, and helping it thrive. Speaking of community, here's a nice review on Apple Podcasts from Joe Mommy. Great, uh, great, uh, great Apple handle, Joe Mommy. Pro tips. This podcast is very informative while also being entertaining for a budding writer. I especially enjoyed hearing about Mott, a memoir that's by Sarah Einstein. And now I can't wait to read it. As many of us memoir writers are also trying trying to make a point, I guess a little typo, but subtly, it was great to learn from the author what her point was and some tidbits that give you an idea of how she went about it. I also appreciated hearing writers of other genres and learning tips that can be applied to my own work. Thank you, Brendan, for putting this out in the world. And you're welcome. You're welcome for the show, and thank you for listening. Snor- s- noise. Smart. Toy. You've heard me say it before. You know how to work out and eat, right? You know what I mean? Like, you know how, you know the fundamentals, but sometimes you don't. So you hire a personal trainer to get you into shape, draw up meal plans, and hold you accountable. Something changes when you throw down some money on that thing, right? Same thing with a writing coach. If you and your work needs a tune-up, reach out to me and I'd love to help you level up. It's about getting you where you need to go on your terms. Working with me will stretch you, it will challenge you, and you will be a better writer for it. You'll be a better editor for it, and you'll start to see things that you couldn't see before. So if you have a book or an essay and you need some help, give me a call. I'd be honored to get you where you want to go. Got it? All right. Hey, Elena is back, man. 
And it was a fun one. So buckle up for the one and the only Elena Passarello. So what's shaking, man? I have a freelance assignment that was supposed to be due on, I believe, April 15th. And we are speaking five days after that. Uh, and uh, I had to push it back because it has turned into kind of a mess. In a good way, though. Uh, it's just more than I bargained for in terms of the nature of the story. And it's due now, but I had just had a new wrinkle show up in terms of source acquisition. So now I'm going to try to push it to, like, first thing Thursday morning. Wow. But it is, like, all, all, millions of sources, tons of science, and then all of my subjects, English is not their first language. Okay. So like it's just like the transcripts are harder the reading the like all of the like supplemental material that i find like youtube clips and things are in spanish so i'm just like everything takes like twice as long um and then um i started reporting it out it takes place in mexico i started reporting it out thinking that i could do most of the work the first week of april but um that's not a very active week in terms of business in mexico because uh it's holy week so Oh, all like, right. It's just been like, ah. um, so my brain is, I'm like Miss, uh, Michael Keaton and Mr. Mom right now. My, my brain is oatmeal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I figured I'd call you. <laughs> I love it. I, I love oatmeal podcasts. This is great. Oh, <laughs> it makes How for are some you? The... What's going on with you? You know, I'm, it's similarly in, in a way, it's like, I, I feel like I've got oatmeal brain also, but it's more from, uh, like just a frenetic case of like go go go, but just feeling like not getting anywhere. You know that feeling? It's just oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do. My pedometer does too. I never go anywhere. Yeah, you walk four yes. steps a day. Yeah, exactly. It's just like trying to you know. There's just so many sort of like balls in the air to juggle, and you know you feel like you're just doing a lot of a lot of work that's just not getting making any progress or like moving the ball. I just feel like it's like. First and ten, then second and ten, then third and ten, and then, mm. God damn it, I got a punt. <laughs> it, just fe- <laughs> it just feels like that, like all the time. So, I'm, in in an effort to really harness attention, like I've I've really dumbed down. Let's just say my phone. I've got no social media, email on my phone. <gasps> all it is is text, phone, Spotify, Headspace, and like uh, I think that's it. And pot my podcast app. So I like truly oh. made it like a 2007 iPhone. And is that helping? In that regard, yeah, because it's not a crutch. Like I, I sense myself reaching for it, like out of those weird, those sort of mm-hmm. down moments between, I don't know, you're reading this and uh, or you're waiting on something. You're like, oh, I'll reach for my phone. Mm-hmm. And I've uh, I, I catch myself in that habit. I'm like, oh wow, well, there's nothing on this worth checking a- anymore. <laughs> so you, you start to realize like how often you're grabbing that thing out of habit. So oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's been helpful. I've been really um really blocking out time in a way where it'll be like you know from 7 to 8 in the morning I'm you know, just working on podcast admin and promo and that's it and so I'm just look at the clock and I, I just get into the kind of zone and mm-hmm. then I look up and I'm like okay I I've got 15 more minutes okay keep keep going on this cuz then you're done at 8 and then you move on to the next thing and I that kind of blocking has been really helping helping me kind of keep a laser focus if you will yeah the deep work or i guess that's not deep work that's more like that pomodoro method where you like you work as hard as you can on a single task for a shorter period of time than all day yeah right? like and then it's like when that time is up you move on to another task and it is that deep work that cal newportian deep work it ethic is. and that's where i've you know where i kind of got the time blocking idea Mm-hmm. from and uh yeah so just kind of kind of do that trying to get land work at more high profile places so then i don't even need social media at all it's just a matter of mm. you know just putting out good enough work where people will kick to the website and hang out there instead of me having to like be in an algorithmic you know shark infested <laughs> waters i'm like ah, i'd rather not be here <laughs> shackled to the algorithm <laughs> right <laughs> exactly Exactly. So yeah, that that's uh yeah, so that's kind of where the heads at. I'm taking this uh freelancers workshop too through um uh Seth Godin's Akimbo workshops. Oh yeah. 
So that's kind of that's kind of cool. That just got rocking and rolling. So that's uh, hopefully open up the open up possibilities and and then I extricate myself from from things that aren't as fulfilling and try to do better work for for the people I want to you know sort of serve, if you will. That's the thing, isn't it? It's like sometimes when you finally get a job that you want, it's hard to make space for it because you're too busy working on other jobs that it's not that they don't want them, but they don't have the same, like you've been working at these other jobs so that you eventually you can get like a big job that you want or a big assignment that you want. And then this is my experience. You know, it's like, I've got all these other little nitpicky things that I have to do when I finally get to like hunker down and write like a real feature. And, um, it's, it's makes me, uh, frustrated, I guess. (laughs) I was gonna say it makes me mad. I'm not mad. I just, I'm like, I just am sad that I guess I'm sad that I I feel like I could do a better job if I had um, just a slightly cleaner professional trajectory right now. I mean, I have like a full time job and two part time jobs as well, which isn't helping my freelance career very much. Yes, I am totally (laughs) under. Yeah, I get you, man. Yeah, (laughs) I'm not a freelancer either. I'm like you sound like you really know what you're doing. I kind of just like fall into these weird projects. And and then I say things like I'm freelancing, but really, like, it's just a fluke. It's just a flukety fluke fluke. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you want to dive in, you know, head first in, in everything. And, but then your your attention is so fractured and you're pulled in so many different directions mm-hmm. in this thing that you want to invest 100 percent of yourself. It's and you end up mm-hmm. you're you, you end up. You know, it's it's just fraction. It, it, it's not like what you want. You want to put it all on, mm-hmm. put it all on the table. I, I mean, I'd be you're fine pulled with like forty percent. You know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, that's fine. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's all it's all good because um, it's good to work. But um, it's just not how I imagined it. I guess that's kind of what being an adult is like: is like revising your expectations from the way that you imagined it when you you weren't grown yet. You know, like um, how did you imagine it? I guess I just thought that it would be like. I would pitch something and, you know, I'd have like a long relationship with a magazine and I would have a beat and I would kind of know the world that I was working in. And so every single time it was like there was it it was like if the the free the the, like freelance feature writing world was a merry go round that I would go jump on and jump off of. But I was very aware of the merry-go-round because it was like in my backyard. But now, like, I feel like every freelance gig is like a different merry-go-round that's like across the state. And I have to learn about the admission fee. And like, there's just this whole like world that you have to kind of with every job that you have to kind of pick up. And it's really unpredictable. And, you know, it's it's I'm finding at least like it's not possible to set the timelines that you wanted. And it's also not possible to feel as confident as I thought I was going to feel. Um which is cool. I mean, that's fine. Everything gets done. I mean, I really like, I don't know, like what kind of freelancing are you doing? I, I guess I'm speaking kind of in the abstract and we should sort of nail down like, like what kinds of freelancing we're talking about here, but like what, what kind of freelance stuff is, uh, are you up to nowadays? So I'm working on, a an ambitious piece on uh, wildfire and climate change Whoa. right now. I, I'm in the, in the discovery phase of the reporting where I'm where I'm uh, interviewing a lot of fire experts and mm. I, I probably have enough tape to write a really nice pitch. So that's a big feature I'm working on. And then I've pitched a, um, a column on spec to a New York times book review. And mm. so I've done that. And then I'm also trying to do some freelance podcast producing and um, you know, some yeah. branded writing too. So that's kind of off my sort of journalistic beat, but you know, that, that kind of thing too. So I'm trying to cobble together that and then, uh, and then, you know, pitching sponsors for the podcast too. So I have kind of like a tripod of thing where it's mm-hmm. like podcast production, journalism, and other branded mm-hmm. things, editing. So What's that's kind branded of branded writing. Is that like writing as yourself from your professional position? Is that what that it is? It would be like, uh, if, you know, like REI has a magazine, so you would like, you know, write a feature that basically, you know, or like Subaru has a magazine. You'd find someone who like drives a cross track and you like write something, you know, basically for them that really oh. ta- kind of touts their, like their brand magazine company. almost. Exactly. It's kind of like faux journalism trades, you know, and a little bit so, like magazine trades, I guess. 
Exactly. And uh, the idea is like they pay really well mm-hmm. too. You know, they can be up, you know, if you're able to land a, a feature for, you know, a Subaru magazine, you know, it can be like, you know, a dollar a word for a long feature or something, which is like unheard of in journalism circles. Yeah. Do you know so, what I yeah. heard, by the way? This is completely <laughs> Hemingway. I, I didn't watch the Ken Burns documentary, but I read a bunch of tweets about it. So now I feel like I watched it. But the Ken Burns <laughs> Hemingway documentary, he was making a dollar a word in like 1940. Jeez. So that's the equivalent now of 19K for a thousand word piece. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> unbelievable and a dollar a word is still good you know what i mean yeah <laughs> like a hundred yes. years later a dollar a word is like all right i'll take it <laughs> good lord that's incredible no. oh. yeah oh man yeah so that's a kind of in you know you know i'm pitching a lot of you know vineyards and breweries to write you know their mm. blog content mm-hmm. and that kind of thing and the idea being like you know if you want to pay me a thousand dollars a month to write four blog posts for you I will try to hammer those blog posts out in a in a great way, but really fast. Mm-hmm. And that way, you know that the the hourly rate is pretty high, and then you kind of mm-hmm. can kind of snowball things that's like a that. Great idea. So that's kind of that's that's the the hustle. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then on top of that, it's like I'm wrestling with this question of not trying to, especially with a podcast, like not be obsessed with growth. Like, what if what if what I have right now is enough? Mm-hmm. And then just trying to like tr- double and triple down and like serve the people who are already in on the joke instead of trying to <laughs> fill up the arena. Like, you know what? No, I've got this yeah. nice, you know, I've got Carnegie Hall. I don't need to go Madison Square Garden. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. so it's, I'm kind of wrestling with that idea and, and uh, you know, reading Paul Jarvis's Company of One and just uh, thinking of thinking in terms of what, what if you ha- already have enough and then just... Oh, yeah you know, like I said, triple down on the people who are already there for you and be there. I wonder if like being a narcissist helps with this, because like if I like when I was an actor, if like five people came to the show, I'd be like, wow, what a crowd, you know, (laughs) because I'm such a narcissist. I just like I can't imagine it ever being better than my own experience, you know, so like (laughs) like, I have a podcast, you know, and I, I think I don't know, we get like six followers and I'm like, six followers that's three <laughs> times as many people that make the podcast like <laughs> i just get so <laughs> excited <laughs> yeah well it's one of those things too where people if they complain about how small their audience is just let's just use a hundred as a as a number mm-hmm. if you put a hundred people like in a lecture hall like that's a lot of people yeah and so if you think of it like that it's like oh my god there's a hundred people out there listening to this thing and if you were in front of a hundred people you'd be like there's a shitload of people here yeah imagine if you had a hundred people at your funeral you'd be like that was a good life (laughs) god damn that's a good life (laughs) evil i'm sorry that's so evil (laughs) <laughs> I'm a little punchy today. <laughs> right, right. So how did you so this is a uh, another bird story you're working on, right? Yes. Um yeah, I am uh I am not in the freelance life in that like I I don't I don't pitch. I don't I I I I just I should, but I don't. Um when I have a book coming out, usually somebody that I'm working with from the press encourages me to pitch certain things in that window of time, but like smart. Usually I'm just kind of like you know, whatever. But <laughs> this uh, editor uh, from Audubon Magazine in December got in touch with me, and I think I think my niche is like now like animal writing when you already have a lot of great animal writing, and you want to hire like a wild card, like mm. a slightly irresponsible, you know, kind of looser kind of canon. Because I think science writing often is full of very reverent people. And so she was like, you know, we just want something different. Do you want to try writing about this really old albatross? <laughs> I said, yeah, if you, if I can write it like gay to Lisa's Frank Sinatra has a cold. And she was like, sure. <laughs> and so I did. And, um, I was convinced that they weren't going to like it, but I, they did. And I can, uh, and then, uh, shortly thereafter, they asked me if I wanted to do another one. And it, it, this one is about, this island off the coast of Baja California Sur. So like kind of like south of like Tijuana and Ensenada and all that stuff. Um, In Mexico, there's a little bitty island that 95% of this one species of bird 
is born on this island. Just these birds really want to to live on this island. <laughs> this is where they want to do their business. And um, that means that people have to be very careful about changing the the um, climate, the bioclimate. And but of course, there's a fishing village there that's run by a fishery and where there are people and industry, there's usually rats and a rat will just like decimate a seabird population. So they discovered one rat like in 2019 and the like MacGyvery catch me if you can Wiley Coyote shit that they did to catch this rat. It's just an amazing story. And so it's just this like weird, you know, it's barely about birds, you know, so she asked me if I would write <laughs> this, this for the magazine. So old birds and rats are kind of where. <laughs> oh, I like, love it. I, it's so much, it, it's like when you read occasionally, like when Karen Russell, like wrote mm. a story about a bullfighter a few years ago, mm. or when George Saunders writes nonfiction. Oh, and I love his nonfiction. Yeah, it's I love it when, you know, novelists, you know, will take on things uh, like will take on journalism and their stuff reads like fiction. And they're like, oh, wow, this is what it's like to have like a really great, you know, a, that sort of powerful sort of voice driven fiction mm -hmm. only applied over to nonfiction and journalism was like, oh, wow, this is electric to read mm. this stuff. So I, the, the fact that you, when you said like, oh, they want this kind of wild card in, like I, that's what I'm picturing. It's like, oh yeah, we can have someone who's got a really amazing voice on the page and let's turn her loose on here. And it, I, I love that they do that. I can't wait to read, read these things. <laughs> well, I mean, there, it won't be George Saunders or Karen Russell, but you know what I love about it um, that I didn't know is, you know, like when you write like a magazine pe feature, there are people there that help you with it. You know, like when I write an essay by myself, like I'm all yeah. alone in the library, terrified to call people, but like not like, and, and especially because Audubon is, is a really trusted magazine. Like they, they're like, call these people about this bird. And then all I had to say is that I was writing for Audubon magazine and they answered the phone and they were so excited to talk to me. And then there's an art person and the art person is finding out all this interesting stuff and passing information along. And then there's an editor who, and a fact checker who help you sort of like smooth out the material. And then there's a copy editor and it just feels like you're not like alone in the void. Like you have to do the work, like you have to build the story, but like, I love this. Like, and then also I didn't have to pick the topic which is so hard for me. I'm always like, it's like such like a dumb, like, oh, is this the one, you know, like some kind of like bachelorette, you know, like, are you the one topic? Are you the one? But no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on deadline. I have to write about this. These are the people that I have to talk to. This is the um, tone and, and timbre of the magazine that I have to somewhat appropriate. Although, you know, I'm not great at it, which I think is what they want. And it's just in that respect, I really enjoy it. And then the other thing is this particular beat, the people that I'm talking to, are amazing like they're just they're saving the planet and they're like the most positive people about climate change that i've talked to these like maverick seabird rescue organizations and they know their shit so yeah. it just feels good to talk to someone who is just crushing it and then you know in my very limited experience i think they also understand that like they don't feel bad being asked questions because these questions are all to celebrate them. Once they figure that out, that I'm not like some kind of hard hitting bird journalist. Like I just want to, I just want the, like the goofy story. It's, it's delight. It's delightful to watch them reflect on this amazing stuff that they did. So in, I mean, in those respects, like I'm really glad to get freelance gigs because it just feels like a really different muscle um and it feels a lot less lonesome it also feels a lot less mine you know like mm -hmm. i can't i can't argue over like the length of a paragraph with these people like they <laughs> i'm kind of like you know they have a standard but in that i think that's kind of freeing too maybe if i was only doing this i'd feel kind of and it, right now i am only doing this but like maybe i would be kind of like i need more freedom but i'm i'm really enjoying the the restraints that it's putting on my writing um, and they're still asking me to be creative inside those restraints, which, you know, is kind of my, my sweet spot. That's awesome. And, and have you experienced any kind of, you know, journalistic imposter syndrome as you, as you go about the reporting for these pieces? 
Well, I mean, I don't think it's imposter syndrome. I think I am an imposter. Like I, mm -hmm. I have t like, and in, in, in this particular situation with the lining up the sources for this, it, I, you know, I am very in over my head. Like they, um, because there's this extra step of um, working with uh, people with different, you know, I don't speak Spanish. They asked me if I spoke Spanish um, and then also it's a remote location. So connectivity is an issue. So just those few little hiccups and then my planning of how to put this together, like is tanking me in some ways. I mean, I'm getting through it. I'll, I'll, I'll be all right. But like, <laughs> like I'm sure that someone who was not an imposter would probably have a much more streamlined way of, of going through it. I'm like, and I'm like such a shitty transcriber. <laughs> and oh my God. It's the worst. <laughs> so bad. I hate it so much. The thing that I've been doing is recording the interviews on zoom and then opening up a word doc and then playing the video and then the word doc or sorry op opening a word doc and then hitting that microphone button the dictate button that microsoft word has now and then playing the video so that it just like records but it doesn't work when someone is speaking heavy heavily accented english it was just <laughs> oh yeah like, like i mean it barely works when people are speaking like the american standard walter cronkite english um so <laughs> So, I've been using um, Otter me. as a transcribing service, and it's not perfect. It's pretty darn good, mm. and you can listen to it play back at you know various speeds too. So, like to me, like the nitty gritty of transcribing a new a recording now is just going through and cleaning up the mm. the transcript, and it, I've found that that's been o okay. Like there. I actually don't speed it up when I have like a journalistic recording because I do want to hear it again and make sure I get everything like really stone cold right. Mm -hmm. If I'm transcribing podcast ones, I usually do it at two times the speed and just like, oh, okay, this is this is cool. If it's not 100%, I'm fine with that. But Wait, so is it otter like the animal? Yeah. And and what are you doing for a podcast that you need to do? You just provide a transcript of every episode is that what you're i do for um uh tier two and up uh patreon uh members i mm. i give them uh, transcripts and i also want the transcripts too because uh in this rigmarole of a podcast there's there's a, a book here with mm. you know talking to hundreds of people about the craft of nonfiction. so um i'm that's right drawing i'm drawing that up like a hitchhiker's guide to cnf so it's oh my it's god so good Oh, yeah, because you talk to everybody, like everybody. So <laughs> it's unfortunately incredible. me twice, but like also real people. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I was go like your uh, episode 123 was your first rodeo on the show. And it was mm -hmm. like one of the you know, people love loved it. And I don't know. You, it's um, you're one. You're one of the names, man. You're one of the headliners, <laughs> as I call it. I mean, you, we talk you for like three hours. <laughs> <laughs> we did i think we talked for a solid two hours in studio it was, it was great oh my god i loved oh. it I, I think i've only had maybe three in studio podcasts mm. just because the nature of it mm -hmm. and uh but yeah you were you were here and we were rock and roll and talking about metallica and baseball and it was it was awesome <laughs> okay so Elena's internet just crapped out. And so there was a gap, you know, kind of a weird gap. So in any case, I'm here just riffing, filling in that gap like spackle over a wall. You punch the wall, and now I'm spackling it over, cleaning up your mess. Ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a weird metaphor. But in any case, we're going to pick this right back up for with, with her podcasting with uh, Justin St. Germain and talking about his amazing new little book that I have to get my hands on after hearing Elena talk about it. Advertising. That's what you could say. <laughs> yeah, <the> mineral ad. <laughs> exactly. Lumber liquidators or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you you were just saying like I, I think I was uh, faking my way through that I knew what a podcast was. True, yeah. And now I'm like, like I you're listen to podcasts it. constantly. Yeah, I'm so. I mean, I don't. I think I learn more listening than I do making one. Making one just feels like. Well, I make it with another person, right? This guy Justin Saint Germain, who ha has been on your show, yeah. He has not yet. Oh, okay. I have He's Son of a Gun out. on my Kindle. 
Uh, I have yet to read. I know it's a f- a few years old at this point, but uh, I, I when I when I when I, when I can get Justin, you know, lined up, I, I plan on reading uh, his memoir. Let me tell you about his new book. Okay, He's got a new one coming out. Yeah, it's out now. Oh, it just shit. came out. Just came out this month, and so "Son of a Gun" is this memoir of um this the murder of his mother, and also kind of like masculinity in the American West, and. Then this new book is part of this series that I really like called Bookmarked, where an author writes about a book or a short story or something that's really meaningful to them. So like Aaron Birch wrote about The Body, which is that Stephen King short story that became Stand By Me. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, And Justin did it on In Cold Blood, um, the Truman Capote quote unquote nonfiction novel that I'm sure everybody knows about. And so it's his, his reckoning with what it means to write a murder story having written a murder story himself and then he just dissects the Capote book um, and it is so well researched it's very quick it's like the kind of book that can fit in your back pocket maybe mm, 40,000 words cool and it is really I mean just really really good Um, and it's about writing it's about what it means to write the truth what it means to you know write about crime what it means to represent people who are no longer around. Um, so it's, I mean, just like right down the alley of this podcast and and probably your readership. Um, you don't have to read Son of a Gun or In Cold Blood to read this book about it, but um, it's also, I think, a really good supplement to both. I had no idea Truman Capote made up half the shit that was in, in Cold Blood. <laughs> I didn't either until um, I, I would say, well, it was probably the 2010-ish around that, like 20. 20- 2008 2010 around there mm-hmm. when uh there was the movie infamous uh was the other oh, take yeah. on it yeah and uh i think i forget who was in who starred in that well daniel craig was actually perry in that version that's right and toby is it toby jones i think the, i think so he's truman was, and he actually looks like truman capote unlike a philip seymour hoffman yeah <laughs> poor philip seymour hoffman i think had to like really like like lay off like he, i think he had to change his body type in order to <laughs> and he was like like eight inches too tall and like a completely different frame yeah and like starved himself or something something terrible like that yeah He's exactly one of my favorite yeah and it was something like yeah capote never even took notes and he claimed that he had a photographic memory or something and um yeah and just <laughs> totally you know made things up to make the story better and the writing is great but it's you can't call it journalism no, no, I, it, it, yeah, this book was a, a real eye opener because I just list, I think I was told all these stories about him. Um, and, but apparently it was debunked in some ways right away, like in the, in the 60s when it was released. But people were so into the way that the story was, the novel part of the nonfiction novel, it just was so compelling and vivid that people didn't want to hear it, which is just, you know, so true crime for me like they, they you don't want the truth that's a true crime you want the feeling of a true crime narrative that's what i think is kind of the problem with a lot of true crime podcasts and books and justin argues in his book that truman capote is kind of the 20th century arbiter of that ushering in that kind of thinking which i yeah so get that book man yeah Talk to Just- it, it's a it's really good Nice. And what's been the experience like of, uh, you know, you're no, you're no stranger to being on mic, but what is, what has it been like having the podcast with Justin? I really liked it, but I think, I, I think, I I mean, I haven't learned anything about tech or anything like that. I just show up, drink a cocktail and scream at him into the microphone. But like, um, (laughs) I think sometimes I have to remind myself that it doesn't count as a social activity. Like, you know, like I'll be like, Oh, I went out this week, but no, I just like, recorded a podcast a conversational podcast with Justin like I'm gonna have a hard time with our conversation not being like oh good I you know I'm not I'm not slowly becoming a hermit like I I socialized but I but I didn't like this isn't this isn't a real conversation and and sometimes I'll be talking to David my partner and I'll be like I'm talking like my podcast self so um hopefully (laughs) post-pandemic I'll have real conversations with people right we'll, we'll shake a little bit loose but I like I like um I very much like thinking about nonfiction in a conversation with him and I feel more obligated to, I'm sure you feel this way to participate as a reader 
in the world of contemporary nonfiction. Not that I was ever not doing it, but now I really feel like I need to be responsible about that, which I think is pretty good for the work um, as well. Yeah, and in in, in these days... To like, what are you, you know, given that you've written these pieces for, for Audubon, so that's a little, a little different than your essayistic purview. Um, so what have you been reading the, to fill the tank and to maybe model some of mm. uh, the writing you're doing that's uh, freelance driven off of, you know, things that you've read, uh, read before you said the first one was kind of like a, an albatross being a freak Sinatra has a cold I mean, did, <laughs> in a way like, did, did, like what, what have you been reading to kind of model that work? I've been trying to pay more attention to the way people write about the natural world, like real people, like legit people, and also people who are kind of irreverent in that way. So Michelle Nyhaus has a book out called Beloved Beasts that is this really interesting history of conservation. She started as a field biologist and sort of found her way to kind of, uh, I think she was the editor of High Country News for a long time. She might still be, um, but she's a great researcher and a great field reporter. Um, so I read that it was really helpful. But then on the other end of the spectrum, I read Matthew Gavin Frank's new pigeon book, which is about diamond smuggling pigeons in South Africa. And (laughs) it's, it's written like a fever dream, but it's also really intensely researched. Um, and I think he even had a legal read and, uh, you know, it's fully sourced, but it's about the diamond industry in South Africa and, um, this sort of pigeon smuggling ring that's part of it uh but it's like you know very kind of speculative and kind of in internalized um and has a lot of velocity to it so I, re- I read that to kind of keep me on my toes um but yeah like I, I like I'm really interested nowadays in um those kinds of things and then you know I'm I'm still such a sucker for performance reading and like how you keep yourself honest when you're talking about things that have nothing to do with you directly. Uh, and, you know, Hanif Abdurraqib is just crushing that on multiple platforms right now. His new book, A Little, A Little Devil in America, which is kind of writing about black performance, both musical performance and theatrical performance. And um, he writes about Whitney Houston and Aretha Franklin and, you know, a female magician from the 1950s and Josephine Baker. The quote, the, uh, the, the title is a quote from Josephine Baker. But then he's also doing all this great stuff with radio and podcasting and almost like blogging, thinking about writing about culture. So I, um, I am turning to his work pretty much on the daily um I think he's kind of a new kind of critic or a new kind of writer about culture and that like it's just just zero snark you know it's Mm -hmm. it's not that all cultural writing is snarky but I think it's kind of wry like Frank Sinatra has a cold is kind of wry but um Hanif is writing from this place of deep love or deep sorrow or deep like kind of courage of understanding and I just it's just a font for me like it's just Mm. I can't stop. Um, and he's got all these different things, not just his books. Um, you know, he's got a radio series with KCRW. He's got another one called like, it's either objects of sound or sound objects. And then he's got this huge project online project where he's making these extensive playlists and essays for every year of music from 1968 to 2005, Mm. (laughs) which is kind of an arbitrary. Yeah. It's kind of an odd time range. But it's got to be wanted, something to it, right? It's something like, you know, he's, you know, he was like a critic for uh, definitely, oh, uh, I can't remember what, like one of the, like Pitchfork. And I think he he wrote a lot for Rolling Stone, but he was like a music critic forever. He's just got, he's just saturated in lots of different kinds of musical cultures. And he wanted to trace his fandom. Um, he also was, was born like 15 years after 1968 or maybe even 20, but, um, he wanted to trace his fandom from Van Morrison's astral weeks to I oh, 2005 and he does it by making these Spotify playlists, writing about them himself, making these websites that are these kinds of like pages of, of magazine clippings and YouTube clips that all correspond to that year. And then asking other people to write about albums that meant something to them from those years. So he's just making this like weird multimedia universe of fandom. I know it's so special. 
it is it's like a it's like a 21st century mixtape absolutely um i and uh it just it's really generous and um also i think totally pandemic driven like i think it is the kind of thing you do when you're like snowed in your house for like <laughs> <laughs> all of the spring of 2000, 2020 but um yeah so those and th- yeah i would say that th- th- that's kind of the triangle right now is like people who really know their shit as nature writers people who push the envelope as nature writers and hanif abdurakeem <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah he's a great testament too to a lot of people think you know my old life was voice stuff like acting and voiceovers and stuff and a lot of people think when you read your creative work you have to be super dynamic but I think he proves that if you stay kind of true and in your voice and practice I think he practices a lot like you you don't need the bells and whistles George Saunders is the same way like you can read your work aloud and be kind of a little low-key about it and still really drive people forward yeah you know what I mean like you don't have to be like like a muppet (laughs) <laughs> like, like like i i read like a muppet <laughs> <laughs> well you speaking of that like you were on a different panel same awp so for, well si- sidebar you know you say you're a nobody like you're on like every single panel that th- that no. there is so so you can stop it there <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but there was the one where you, I, you think you were talking about the 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 sex jokes gorilla <laughs> oh <laughs> and <laughs> And the way you were, the way you were performing the this piece was hilarious. I remember the person who had the read after you was like, "How the hell am I supposed to follow that?" Yeah, I told them I was like, they asked me what they what I was going to read. They they said you need to read something short because it's about short pieces. And I said, "This is the shortest piece I have, but don't put me first, like because it's just an awful, like ridiculous. It's like the Daffy Duck, you know. Like it's, I'm just going to set the whole room on fire and then run away. Like don't do it." <laughs> And uh, yeah, I think they thought that I wanted to be last because I wanted to like be like and, you know, like the the, the final act or whatever. But no, it's just like I'm going to throw a stink yeah, well, who's bomb. Who's this? this Who does she think she is? Axl Rose? Yeah. No, seriously. <laughs> or like uh, the Tammy show when um, the Rolling Stones said they had to follow that they had to come after James Brown. And then James Brown was like, oh, OK. And then he did the whole thing with the cape and please, please, please. And people just lost their minds. And then the Rolling Stones took the stage and everybody was too exhausted to clap for them. Like, <laughs> that's what they thought I was saying. But really what I was saying was, this is the stupidest piece and I'm going to ruin your event. So put me last because out of respect for the more famous people that are on this panel that actually wrote things of substance. Like, but they, <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> I just had to, I'm working with a Dutch translator for the Dutch translation of the animals book right now. Uh, and I, and she was, I, I, she was like, what is this? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe the Dutch don't need to read it. Like they don't have the aristocrats. They don't have any of the puns. They don't have the broken sign language lexicon of a American gorilla. I was like, yeah, maybe this doesn't need to be in the German version. (laughs) That is hilarious. You know what I was thinking of when you were talking about the, the reporting you were doing for, for this piece and that you were talking about you know, just talking to really cool people. And it, you reminded me a lot of, uh, Allie Ward and her podcast ologies. Like, have, mm. have you heard of this show? Mm-mm, no, she talks to just, uh, you know, I don't know, fulminologists who are like a guy who studies lightning. Uh, she, you know, she huh. talks to, you know, a dendrologist, which is you know, just a, you know, a tree scientist. And, uh, so she just, an urologist, Ooh. I believe, is the latest one. A study a person who studies bears, and and so like she's just a a person who's just deeply curious, and she's actually, she's a really good interviewer, and just uh, is very excited and engaged. And the show is produced in a kind of fun way too. Oh, but just the, your your approach reminds me. It's just like oh. I like you guys are really experts at what you're doing. I just want to hear some hear some cool shit about what you're talking about. I'm going to take notes yeah. and I'm going to record this, but just tell me everything you know. And it's just yeah. that kind of energy. I think you'd really jive with that show. <laughs> I am totally adding it to my right now. I've got too many news podcasts, so I need I need something. Oh, this will be nice because she's pretty she's pretty funny too. Like she just kind Ology. of interjects. It. Like she'll have the interview part, then she kind of like will you know just interject you know in post about something sometimes a stupid pun or she comes in there to just kind of uh further sort of um do a little exposition and maybe 
tighten up something that took the person 10 minutes to say, and she'll say it in 20 seconds. So like, she'll mm -hmm. just kind of sum things up and then it goes back to the conversation and say, it's really mm -hmm. well done. I, I dig it. And I think you'll dig it too. Oh, I can't wait. That's so exciting. Yay. Oh, I love having a new thing, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> like a new thing. Once I get this rat story finished, I get to, I get to enjoy podcasts again. <laughs> cool. And it's, I, I put out a, a feeler on the, the Patreon page asking for, you know, people who are, who are there if they want to ask a question. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a question I, I tend to I've, I've probably asked you in the past, but uh, I do tend to ask about like envy and jealousy and resentment and that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> because me, I'm just like the picture of avarice, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, uh, Betsy, who's a who's a patron, she was actually at the CNF and happy hour that you were so gracious to to uh, to join. Um, hey, uh, Betsy. Yeah. And she she wrote in that she says, I struggle with envy, jealousy and sometimes resentment of other writers and I'm curious if this curious if this happens to others or has happened and what makes them feel better about themselves well I um I definitely experience it I think uh I think it's okay to experience it I I think you can in some respects if you want you can rename it um I think it's your ambition I think it's your drive your interest your fervor that makes you feel that way because these opportunities are all opportunities in the field that you have fallen in love with, or at least fallen in like with. So, um, I don't think you have, maybe if you rename it, you won't feel as bad <laughs> about being jealous. Uh, but, uh, the other thing is like, it's hard, it's hard for me to stay envious and jealous when I know that the things that they're doing, I could never do. Right. Like everybody's writing projects are so, uniquely their own you know even yes. though we're both writers and that's the thing that like we could be kind of jealous of is oh you got this grant or oh you got this opportunity I want that opportunity there is no way that I could have done what that person did to get it because it's just the only thing that I can do is the thing that I do so then I just have to keep putting the energy into the thing that I do because you can't compare the thing that I do to the thing that other people do. So I, I, I kind of do it that way, right? I go, it's okay to feel this way. It's okay to be ambitious. Ambitious. It's okay to want, um, it's okay to want things, but also like, remember what they're doing and what you're doing are not as similar as you think. They may both be called writing, but like you're on your own trip. So stay on your trip and come correct. And then, you know, just keep moving forward. The other thing is like I have had like a, a modicum of success and it doesn't change the fact that those feelings exist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like or like you'll see some like New York Times bestselling author like complaining about some kind of thing that they think is piddling that you would give your eye teeth to have. <laughs> right. You know, and it's like, well, and, and I, I, I remember thinking like, oh, when I get my first book out, I won't feel this way anymore. Or if I, if I ever got like a award that was nationally publicized that I, or if I ever, if I got reviewed in the New York times, um, and it went okay. And, you know, some of those things have happened to me and I still feel this way. So it's just like, there, it's not real. It doesn't mean anything about where you're at to feel this way. That's just platform after platform after platform of of places where, where you might. And so then you can just go and do your thing. Just do your thing. Everybody, Betsy, everybody, just do your thing. Like, yeah. It's, Cause it's like what you said, Brendan, like that woman who's hosting ologies, the podcast, the thing that you love about her is that she's like following the nose of her own enthusiasms, right? Like that's the thing. One of the things that makes you want to keep listening and what makes people want to answer questions and it's true. Like, that's the only thing that I love in the world, really, other than my cats. Like, I love people's I love tapping into what people do when they're left to their own devices. That for me, that is just the best. So just keeping leaving yourself to your own devices. <laughs> for me, that's the highest art you can practice. I guess another thing is that, like, jealousy and envy is really time consuming. Yeah. 
and and, and I don't have time. Like I, 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 I'm spending too much time beating myself up for my own in, imperfections. Like I don't have time to be envious of other people's achievements. I got work to do. Right. So, and and you know, so maybe and that's another thing that's kind of like helps me focus is like there's there's just too much that I want to get done to spend too much time. It's okay to feel that way and let yourself sort of have a couple of feelings, but then you got to keep moving on because tick, tick, you know, tick tock. For sure. Uh, Daniel um, Kalu- Kaluuya, I think that's how you pronounce his name, the actor. Yeah. Uh, he was on WTF a couple, maybe last week or two weeks ago. And he just said something that just was so perfect. And I think just cuts through the jealousy and the bullshit. That's all that, that people deal with. And it's just like, I'm just paraphrasing, but he was just like, I just give myself 100% to the role. You know, I just, I'm all in Mm -hmm. and that's it. Like that's the reward. And there's Mm -hmm. no looking over his shoulder. It's just like, I am, he's just like so invested in a role and in the work that he doesn't care about anything else. I was just like, yeah, when you give yourself over what freedom that is, because you just left it all out there. And, uh, you know, I did my best and damn it. That's, that's the reward. And I love yeah, that. Yeah, I, I have like a daily or a weekly calendar. It's just like a single page. And then I write all the things that I have to do every day. And lately I've been writing at the top of the page, not because of jealousy, but just because of like anxiety and fatigue and overwhelm. I just wrote, I write, work alone is your privilege, never the fruits thereof. And I have no idea who fucking said it. But um, let's just say it was George Bernard Shaw, even though it wasn't, or the Bible. I don't know. Or like, I don't know, maybe it was like Missy Elliott or something. But <laughs> like, it's true that like, it's it's true that like the thing that I am, you know, I'm, I'm get going on like 20 years in this game. And I think the thing that the thing that I feel the most about when I look back on it is the fact that I got to do the work. The fact that I got to, like he said, uh, throw myself into you know, this, this stupid rat thing that's tearing the ass out of me right now. Like, like it's, it's still like, I'm so glad that I talked to you. I'm, no shit. Like I, I, I hit save, logged onto this thing with you and now I'm going to log off and I've got to finish this. I have like 12 hours to finish this, but I'm so glad that we talked because it's true. Like I, I had to remind myself through rambling into this microphone at you that like, like what, what a privilege to be able to, to let your body and your brain work. Like, <laughs> like it's just such a I mean maybe that's maybe this is like the consumerist like weird economy that like has just driven me to be some kind of like pawn of capitalist labor or whatever <laughs> but like I just I still have, I still think it's a beautiful thing to be able to work <laughs> fantastic well Elena thank you so much for for doing this and best of luck with the rat piece and <laughs> a sentence every writer hopes will be uttered <laughs> <laughs> thank you and good luck with whatever non-rat oriented professional material you're going to be working on this week my good man <laughs> you got it uh, as always what a pleasure and uh let's let's do this again in uh in uh you know not too distant future yeah i'll see you on the other side of the deadline <laughs> <laughs> isn't she the best She's overwhelmed, she's stressed out, she's got oatmeal brain, she's past deadline, and yet she hopped on the phone to do a podcast with her friend just a little, a little ways down the five. And she's got that Shure SN, she's got that Shure NB7 microphone. She sounds even better than I do. What the hell, man? That's like a, uh, granted it's the, the, the radio station she works for, but that's like a Five, four or five hundred dollar microphone I want it but anyway this one works really good right it's not the wand it's the wizard chew on that one these days are hella overwhelming too much on my plate and I wonder why I can't seem to accomplish anything I don't even know how this podcast comes together week after week I, I swear There's a podcast gremlin that crawls out from the depths of my studio and puts it together. Right now, I don't even know where I am. I I blacked out probably months ago, and yet, here we are. I've got a few pitches out. I've got a one, one piece on spec that's out there to celebrate the 14th anniversary of the publishing of the four hour work week, and it's titled How the Four Hour Work Week Ruined My Life. Uh, 
I've got my day job. Uh, I'm trying to sell the baseball book. I'm working on this ambitious wildfire piece. I'm in Seth Godin's freelancers workshop. I'm trying to sell my baseball book. Did I already say that? See, I'm trying to grow my client base a little bit. Yeah, I read for the podcast, read some shit for pleasure, whatever that means anymore. You know, work out, keep the house clean, walk the dog, don't get COVID. My mother's memory is like really going. I mean, it, everything's a mess, man. At least I deleted all social media and email from my phone. So now it only plays podcasts, Headspace, Spotify, texts and calls, and takes pictures of questionable quality. I recommend it. I only access social media and email from my desktop. Anyway, moving on. I'm reading Paul Jarvis's Company of One. I'll throw that one in the newsletter as a recommendation, but I figured I'll just talk about it here momentarily. This really speaks to me since I started my uh, Exit 3 Media, which puts together this podcast. To be frank, Exit 3 Media is just me. But anyway, it's proudly a media company of one. And the main idea is that uh, to stay nimble, small, resilient. And you ask yourself often, like, what if you have enough and you set upper limits and you don't just try to unilaterally grow for growth's sake? You know, what if you have enough? And isn't that a great question? I've been consumed with podcast growth, audience growth for years I'd love to get to that that sweet spot of like 20,000 downloads per episode. Depending on the guest, it's closer to 800 to 1,000 per month, well, per episode, and then 6,000 roughly a month. Yeah. For some podcaster, that's nice. I, I, su- I suspect for, for most, that's embarrassingly small, and they're like, Brendan, you really shouldn't, uh, shouldn't say that. It's pretty, yeah, you shouldn't be talking about that. It's not really that good. And uh, maybe, maybe right now you're embarrassed for me, and I, I'm sorry. I'm just being forthright. But what if that's enough, right? What if all we do is make this show better and better for the people who are already showing up? You know, that's great. I can't overlook how amazing that is that people even download this thing and listen to it, engage with it, and share it, and let me let me know, leave reviews, and all that stuff. It's incredible. It is incredible. You know, what if I just you know, did everything I could just to, to retain you, to keep your attention, to keep you from unsubscribing, to keep you in the loop, make something that excites you so that it's appointment listening. And, and that come Friday, CNF Friday, if for some reason the show didn't publish, you'd be like, where's my CNF? Where's B.O.? Where'd he go? Is he okay? Did he die? Did he get T-boned by a truck while he was on his bicycle? It could happen. It's almost happened. So that's a big reason why I put out feelers on Patreon for questions. So, you know, questions that you'd like me to ask. You know, I, I, I follow my own taste and I, I try to ask questions that are in service of the listener, too, that also challenge the guest. Uh, but it's primarily my own taste. And mostly that aligns with you guys because I'm in the mud, too. But giving you some of that agency and credit for those, it's... Uh, it's what this show's about. So you feel less alone, more empowered to go about the work and run your own CNF and race. And as Bronwyn Dickey would say, to plow your own acre. So please consider the Patreon community for all kinds of goodies. But just know that I'll make this show with the assumption that I've got enough. And then maybe the great irony there is, is that it will grow. But I'm not going to worry about that. All I'm going to worry about is making the best possible show for you. Looking right at you. Yeah, yeah, you. You can you can put your hand up. You can nod. I'm looking you right in the eye right now. Uh, not making this weird or anything, but yes, you. I'm talking to you. So in any case, I'm grateful you're here, and I'm going to keep busting my ass for you. We good? Well, that's good. Stay cool, CNFers. Stay cool forever. See ya.